Thank you, Seth. And we are continuing in 2 Timothy. We're in chapter 4, coming to the end of our study in this brief book. We're going to look at verses 6 through 8, which is a brief portion of Scripture, but very significant one about death, but also about life, about eternal life, but also the life that we're to live right now, how Paul lived his life. Paul writes, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Someone has described 2 Timothy as a letter written in the shadow of the scaffold. It is Paul's last letter to Timothy, which he wrote while sitting on death row. So facing death, his mind was very much focused. He wrote what he thought was vital. And one of the great values of this brief book is that it shows the Christian how he or she should face death. That's the subject of our verses. My departure has come. Paul says. It's not a subject people like to talk about. Even Christians uh, tend to avoid this kind of subject. In one of his books, James Boyce wrote of a woman who was dying. She was a Christian and she was visited often by her Christian friends. She described how they would try to look cheerful When they entered the room, they would talk about church and about getting about her getting better and uh, being with them again. They know I'm dying, she said. I know I'm dying, but they don't want to talk about it. So they put on a pleasant face and pretend the evil isn't there. But it is there. It's there for all of us. Death is always stalking us. Unless the Lord returns in our lifetime, we will all die. And ignoring the subject doesn't change that. So we need to know how to face death. And Paul gives us some help in doing that. He went before us in death, and he is a model to follow. In three verses, he records how he faced death what he called in 1 Corinthians 15, the last enemy. He faced it with courage because he faced it with hope. He writes of it as a present experience in verse 6, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. That is an unusual description of death, a drink offering. But it is a positive description, one he borrowed from the Old Testament and the custom of pouring out wine at the base of the altar as an offering. Paul viewed his life as being like that. His blood would be shed and his life would be poured out like a libation of wine on the altar. So he didn't consider his death pointless or his life wasted by the executioner's sword. It would end... In the Lord's service, it would end as an offering to Him. That's the greatest way for a life to end. He describes it as already happening because the sentence had been passed and His martyrdom was so imminent that it was as though it had already begun. He he knew it would happen. He had no illusions. He wasn't living in denial. But he didn't face death with grim resignation. He faced it confidently. He faced it more than confidently. He faced it triumphantly. He knew death was not 
his demise. It was his departure. That's how he describes it. The time of my departure has come. It's a picturesque way of referring to death. The word departure was used in Greek literature of the loosing of a ship from its moorings of weighing anchor and leaving port to travel to another place. It was used of soldiers breaking camp and moving from one place to another. It's a hopeful description of death because it suggests the idea of a journey and a destination and indicates that the grave is not the end of everything. The Greeks and the Romans also spoke of death as a journey. They had stories of the boatman Charon who would ferry souls across the river Styx to Tartarus. It was a gloomy voyage to a gloomy place in the underworld. There were probably some simple souls that believed that when Paul was writing this, but I, I suspect the Greek poet Theocritus spoke for most people in Paul's day. He said, hopes are for the living, but the ones who die are without hope. Now that's a very modern idea of death. This life is all there is. This is it. And when it's over, that's it. Blackness, nothingness. That's despairing. That's the best the world can come up with. That fits Paul's statement to the Thessalonians when he encouraged them a lot of their friends had passed on, family members, other believers. They were confused over that, so Paul gives them some encouragement. He tells them that we don't grieve over our dead, as do the rest, meaning the pagans, who have no hope. That is something to grieve over, to lose a loved one and have no hope. The Christian grieves. Paul indicates that in that statement. But the Christian has hope. The Bible promises us a departure from the shadows of this world into the light of God's presence. It describes the world to come in different ways for different reasons, all of them magnificent descriptions. There's John chapter 14. We have in verses 1 through 3 the Lord describing heaven as a great house, the Father's house, with many apartments. We just sang in mansions of glory and endless delight. That's, a, that's a, a description taken from the King James description of John 14, verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. It's really not the sense of the Lord's statement here. It's, I think, better translated, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, I, for I go to prepare a place for you. The point that, that the Lord is making to these disciples who were very discouraged at this point, they thought they were about to embark on the kingdom of God on the earth, and they realized after the Lord's description of what was about to take place with his betrayal and his arrest, that it was all coming to an end. And so he's encouraging them. No, it's not coming to an end at all. And he says there's a place. Heaven, it's a place, a real place. It's not a place where we'll live in, in, in isolated splendor, but it's essentially a place of warm fellowship. That's the point that he's making to them. We're not going to be separated forever or for long. We, we will all be there together and with others, with multitudes of others. We'll be with Christ, of course. We'll be with other believers, with friends and family and with the people of God down through the ages, multitudes and multitudes of people, and we'll know them all and know them all well. So heaven is a place of reunion and communion. It and the kingdom to come will be glorious, of course. I don't doubt that the apartments that we will have, the dwelling places will be mansions beyond anything we can can imagine it will be glorious. And Jesus said in his upper in his uh, high priestly prayer that he desired to show his disciples his glory. And so we will see his glory and we'll see it in a place of great glory. And we read about that. That's another description that's given. Revelation chapter 21, verse 21 speaks of a great 
city with, great, with gates of pearl and streets of gold. We know that heaven is a place without sorrow. In Revelation 7, verse 17, we read that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. In fact, it will be a place of unimagined joy and fulfillment. All of this is metaphor, it's figurative language to describe what our finite minds are incapable of understanding. What, what is to our finite minds indescribable and immeasurable. The, the realities of what it is and what is to come. What it is right now and what it will yet be with the kingdom to come and the new heavens and the new earth after that. We cannot begin really to comprehend what awaits us. Paul said as much in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. Things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. You haven't heard, you haven't seen what awaits us. And we cannot begin to comprehend the greatness of it, the greatness of the glory to come, the richness of the fellowship to come. We can at best only have a a faint impression of an impression of it. C.S. Lewis, though, had some insightful thoughts on heaven. The believer who dies is, he said, beginning chapter one of the great story which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. If we can think of eternity in terms of time and succession of events, then each moment will be filled with joy that is greater than the previous one. It will be an experience of ever-increasing understanding and happiness that will never end, that will only expand and increase, go on and on forever and ever, world without end. Who can begin to comprehend that? Eternity. It never ends, and it never stops getting better and better. Well, Paul didn't dread that. He told the Philippians earlier during his first Roman imprisonment that he was hard-pressed between his desire to stay with them and minister for their good. He loved them. He wanted to do that. Do that. He wanted to be with them and help them and serve them in any way. But for himself, he said, to depart and be with Christ, that's better. That's gain, he said. All of that, he knew, was in the hands of the Lord. He has numbered our days. But now, at last, the time of Paul's departure had come. What the world considers the end is for the church the beginning the voyage to the final destination. And so for Paul, shackled in chains in a cold, dark dungeon, it was release. We Christians are like people who stand on one shore and look across the sea to a distant land beyond the horizon. Have you ever done that? Maybe you have. You stood on a coast, maybe the Atlantic, and you look out toward the east and you maybe see boats out there and you see the horizon and you know over there is Europe and over there is Great Britain. You know they're there, but you can't see them. Well, we can't see the, the heavenly land, but we know that it is there and that many have gone before us, have safely arrived, and they're there waiting for us. Paul was ready to join them. And, and he would leave without regrets as he sat in jail waiting for death. He reflected on his life. He reflect, reflected on his ministry of some 35 years. And he saw it in, in three figures from the world of sports, a boxer, a runner, and a victorious athlete who played by the rules. The boxer is seen in that statement, I have fought the good fight. The word fight is agon. 
We get our word agony from it, and it indicates physical exertion, a, like a, a long, grueling boxing match. That's how Paul spoke of his life. He spoke of it that way in, in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 26. I box in such a way as not beating the air. He hit the target, but he also got hit. We know that. A few years ago, I was at the Getty Museum when it had an exhibit of bronze statues from Greek and Roman times. I'd read about this in the paper uh, some months before I went, and then I was there. I was glad to know that I was there at that time with that exhibit, and I was interested in one particular statue, a Hellenistic statue that was found on one of, the, of Rome's seven hills, and it's a statue called Boxer at Rest. It's really a masterpiece. His hands are, are wrapped for the fight. He has a scarred and bruised face. He has cauliflower ears, a broken nose, a battered mouth, broken teeth. And he's sitting either between rounds or at the end of the match, and he's, he's looking up. And he's either looking at someone or looking at the, the, the crowd around him. But he's looking with a dazed expression of exhaustion. Now, I don't know if Paul ever saw that statue. I doubt that he did. But if he had, he would have looked at it with empathy. When I saw it, I thought of Paul. That was his life. That was his ministry. It was grueling. It was life in the ring. He spent much of his ministry walking and traveling the rough roads of the empire from one end to the other, from, from Arabia to Spain. He suffered danger from the elements and from men with shipwrecks, cold and hunger, beatings and imprisonments. He exhausted himself evangelizing the nations, teaching the churches, debating in synagogues and marketplaces, standing in chains before kings and governors, defending the gospel. In Ephesus, he said, I fought with wild beasts. And always he stood against the schemes of the devil and struggled against the spiritual rulers and powers and the world forces of this darkness. That was Paul's life. He was an apostle by calling, but as you know, a tent maker by profession. That's how he supported himself. He didn't build houses. He made tents. So even the work with which he supported himself, the work of his hands promoted the very thing that he taught, promoted the pilgrim life. And that's what he was. He didn't live for time. He lived for eternity as a pilgrim passing through, fighting the fight, and running the race. That's his next description. I have finished the course. After his conversion in Damascus, Christ told Ananias, who was sent to baptize Paul, called Saul at that time, and he told him, told Ananias, the course that he had set for Saul, the course that this man would run. And in Acts 9, verses 15 and 16, he said that Paul would bear his name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, and he would suffer much for the Lord's name. Paul understood that. Paul accepted it. He understood, as few of us have, the greatness of grace and mercy, and he was more than willing to suffer for the Lord that had done all of that for him. And so he did. He ran the course. He was following God's will and, and would not be turned aside from it. And that is the kind of courage, that's the determination that you and I need. We all have a course to run. God knows the path. You and I don't know it really, not, not fully, not in detail. The Lord knows it. He set it out and it unfolds before us as, as, as in his providence 
as we follow Him, as we follow in obedience to His Word, we follow that course that He set for us. What we can know today, right now, is be obedient. And as we are, the course unfolds. Paul did that. That's how we run the race. And so we can come to the end of it if, as we do that, as we live faithfully, as we live obediently, moment by moment, as Paul did, and say, as he said, I have kept the faith. Kept the faith like an athlete that completed the race fairly according to the rules and won the race. Throughout his ministry, he remained faithful. He remained loyal to the charge that had been given to him. He stayed true to his mission and was faithful to Christ to the end. This is Paul's concern for Timothy. It's the reason he wrote to Timothy. It's the reason he wrote this paragraph. Remember, Timothy is struggling. See that in, in, the, in 1 Timothy. You see it in 2 Timothy. He's beaten down. He's worn down. He's thinking about staying on the sidelines, and Paul is encouraging him. Encouraging him to stay true to the mission and the calling that he had been given. This is why he gave Timothy the order to preach the word, as he said in this previous paragraph. Why he told him to be sober in all things. Paul was about to depart. His death was imminent. He wouldn't be there to support Timothy any longer and give him advice and give him encouragement, give him a, a hand to help. So Timothy needed to be sober. Timothy needed to endure hardship and fulfill his ministry so that he could say with Paul, I have kept the faith. Some men don't. The Bible and our, our own experience are full of examples of them. But Paul did. He had boxed to the end and run the race past the finish line. He'd done it the right way, and he could say, I have kept the faith. And so, like an ancient champion returning from the Olympic Games, he waited for his ship to take him home to a hero's welcome. And in verse 8, Paul describes the glory that awaited him. In the future there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul was confident. He knew the future and had no doubts because he knew God's promises. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the Proverbs tell us. The fear of the Lord. That means we begin believing the Lord. That's how we begin. If we don't begin believing the Lord, we will have all kinds of myths that we believe in. And there are plenty of modern myths today, such as the universe is self-originating, self-designed, it carries itself on in, in magnificent order. That's a myth. But if you don't believe in God, if you don't know the Lord, if you don't fear Him, you won't know anything. And certainly what, what Paul had as first and foremost in his mind, as any child of God does, is the fear of the Lord. He knew Him and believed Him, and that means he believed His promises and held them with certainty. So he knew what to expect. He knew what was before him was glory and a crown. That recalls the, the, the trophy an athlete, an athlete won in the Greek games. Their, their crowns were relatively worthless. In fact, they were really completely worthless in and of themselves. They were laurel wreaths made of leaves or evergreen. But they were highly prized. And the owners of them were greatly honored. Bishop, Bishop Handley Mole, one of the older commentators, wrote of this. He wrote, Many a little town in those days took down a piece of its white wall in order that its son, crowned with the crown of the Isthmus 
or of Olympia might enter by a gate unused before. To honor the their hero of their little village or their town who had just competed in the Olympic Games and been triumphant, they would make a hole in the wall. They would make a gate that no one had ever been through. It was so that he, for the first time, and maybe only time, would enter in. They honored such men. Well, the prize that, that Paul would receive is something far better than that. The crown of righteousness. Some question as to what that means, how we're to understand crown of righteousness. Is it a crown consisting of righteousness? Uh, or is it a crown that is a reward, not defined, but some reward for his righteousness? Since it's difficult to see how righteousness is already prepared, and it seems more consistent with the description of the image of an athlete winning and receiving this prize. I think that's the idea of this second one. It's a reward for his righteousness, for his, his faithfulness. And so it will be an eternal testimony to that for Paul, for his, his devotion to the Lord, the righteousness of his life. Righteousness that the apostle would say ultimately is a gift of the Lord and through his grace, but nevertheless it's what he did and is the, the, um, the reward that he will get that is in a sense in complete contrast to the guilty sentence that was handed down to him by his human judge. He's on death row. He's considered a guilty man, but he... He would leave this world condemned by Nero, but he would go on to stand before a higher court where the emperor's verdict would be reversed by Christ, the righteous judge, and he would be accounted as a righteous man and crowned with righteousness. Now he's the one, the righteous judge, to whom we are accountable. And what he thinks of our lives really is all that matters. The crowns that men may place upon us, the awards they may give us, they are like those Greek garlands that would wither by the end of the day. God's verdict and his reward, that was Paul's hope. And it's not just for Paul and great saints like him. Paul adds, and not only for me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. That's the Christian. The Christian loves Christ. That is why we love his appearing. And it will be a glorious appearing. That, that is what this word appearing means. It, it's the same word that Paul used in verse 1 of chapter 4. Uh, epiphania, epiphany kind of a revelation, well, it was used in classical literature of a, of a sudden and unexpected appearance of an army. And when the Lord comes, he will appear suddenly, brilliantly to deliver his people and vindicate them. And so the Christian loves his appearing, longs for it. He or she doesn't fear it. And the reason we don't fear it, or we, the reason we should not fear it if we do, is because our judgment has already taken place. Our judgment occurred at the cross where the debt was fully paid, where Christ could say, it's finished. And so for the Christian, the Lord's appearing will not be a time of judgment, but of salvation. It will be a time of joy and crowns. The Bible ends on that hope. In Revelation 22, verse 20, the Lord says, yes, I am coming quickly, and John answers, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Now, that's the attitude that Paul had, and by implication, that's the attitude he urges here. It's the attitude that we should all have. It's the attitude of, of the world-weary saint for whom the world holds no charm. Maybe, though, we are not all world weary, at least not to the degree that we ought to be. And 
And by that, I don't, I don't mean that uh, we should be morose. I don't mean that we ought to put on a gloomy face or have a, a depressed attitude toward life. Really, just the opposite is true. Paul told the Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Joy is to be the characteristic of our life. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. We, of all people, ought to be joyful, regardless of the circumstances. We can have joy in the worst of circumstances because we know we have eternal life. And whatever we go through is temporary and glory is coming. And because we do have eternal life, we ought to be looking forward to the consummation of it with the Lord's return. Paul was, he hadn't invested his life in this world. So leaving it wasn't difficult for him. If our thoughts are not much on the Lord's return, maybe it's because we're too invested in this world. We're too invested in good things. I'm not talking about investing in bad things. Being invested in good things, but, but not being invested in the very best things. In temporal things, not eternal things. John said, the world is passing away. And so are we. It was Longfellow who wrote, and our hearts like Muffled drums are beating funeral marches to the grave. I think that's a very well put, insightful statement. I don't know Longfellow's spiritual condition, but that's certainly true. Every breath that we take, every beat of our heart marks another step forward to the grave. Someday we will all come to that. Someday we will all come face to face with death. We shouldn't avoid that subject. We should think about it. Think about it seriously. But think about it with hope. Death is the last enemy. That's what Paul said. It brings separation and it, it brings sorrow. That's true. But for the Christian, it's not the end. And it's not something to be feared. Its sting has been removed by Christ. He removed our sin and guilt by dying in our place. He bore our penalty. Death can only touch us physically. It cannot touch us spiritually. It cannot touch us eternally. Now, it doesn't mean that death is easy. For some, it is not. Some Christians have hard deaths. Death is not something to be flip about, to dismiss casually. I think we can do that as Christians particularly when we're healthy and we don't think we're anywhere near that moment. But the Lord didn't take it lightly, didn't treat it casually. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His godly ones. He is infinitely concerned and involved in our final experience. And so as we face it, we must trust the Lord about it. We must look to Him. His, his plan for us is best whatever it might be. And while He does not promise any of us an easy death, He does promise us a triumphant death. He promises that to the child of God, to the believer in Jesus Christ. Still, I think some Christians don't come to the end of life with the satisfaction and joy that Paul had but with regrets. Spurgeon spoke of men whose dying pillow was stuffed with sharp thorns. So how do we avoid that, that pain of conscience and gain what Paul had? We do what Paul did. Face reality. And one way we do that is recognizing that life is short. We cannot hold on to the world and the things of the world for very long. It, it, that's a bad investment. Secondly, be faithful. Paul could come to the end and say, I have kept the faith. He was active in service for the Lord. He boxed and he ran and he fought the good fight. Are we doing that? One of the, the keys to a good death 
is an active life. And when I say active life, I mean in the Lord's service. We all have that opportunity. Every one of us has that opportunity. Regardless of your circumstance, your place in this world and in this life, we all have the opportunity to serve the Lord in our home or at work. We have the opportunity to serve Him here, to serve the body of Christ. But that doesn't just happen. That doesn't happen by the bootstrap, so to speak by just willing it to happen. We need a vision of the Lord to do that, to move us to do that, to where we want to do that. We need to see Him as He is in His great love and His grace and His mercy, in His sovereign care for us, one that we can trust in completely and know that He is always receiving of us, regardless. I think we do that at least in part, large part, by following the counsel that Paul gave to the Colossians. He said, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. And that, that takes discipline. And I, I will confess, I've experienced the frustration of reading that and thinking about it. So I'm going to do that. And the next thing you know, your mind's on something else. But this is the key to a, 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 a life that is properly gauged for the proper response and the proper life that we're to live. It involves study. It involves reading the Bible, being under the ministry of the Scriptures. We can't do that alone. We need to be involved with fellow believers. We need to be serving them and being served, being encouraged. That was Paul. He was involved in the church he was surrounded by the church. He was surrounded by believers, by good companions, like those two in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress who helped each other on the way and helped each other cross the river. Or at least hopeful help Christian cross the river. He had a very difficult time. That was the The last step in the journey, they had to cross the river in order to come to the bank of the good land and enter into the celestial city. But as I said, Christian's crossing was not easy at all. He sunk in its depths. He was fearful. He cried out in despair. But Hopeful was there to encourage him, and he quoted scripture to him. And after a long struggle, Christian found good ground to stand on. Bunyan, and this is characteristic of that book, was realistic. He understood the experiences of the saints. And he knew, even to the end, Christians struggle. Many struggle in death. It is not easy. But God is always faithful. Crossing the river doesn't depend upon us and our strength. It depends wholly and completely on Him. And He is always with us through it and to the very end. And the two reached the other bank. And when they entered the city, they were transfigured. They were given new clothes and crowns. And the bells of the city rang for joy. Bunyan wrote, Now, just as the gates were opened, And let in the men, I looked in after them. And behold, the city shone like the sun. The streets also were paved with gold. And in them walked many men with crowns on their heads. They heard singing. They heard praises. And then Bunyan writes, And after they had shut up the gates, which when I had seen, I had... Let me read that again. And after that, they shut up the gates which when I had seen, I wished myself among them. If we could just get a glimpse of that, if we could just get a glimpse of heaven and what awaits us, which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, we too would wish ourselves among them. Death is a solemn thing. Christians don't have a death wish And don't live morbid lives. Life is a gift and it is to be lived 
fully. It is be, to be lived with gratitude and joy. And part of that is enjoying the good gifts of this world that God has given to us freely to be enjoyed. Death ends that. Death is an enemy, but not an enemy to be feared. Its sting has been removed. And God has made our enemy his servant to bring us instantly into his glorious presence where he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Now that's the hope of every Christian. It's the hope that we should have if we're Christians and that we need to think about and focus upon. That's our hope. The question is, is it your hope? Do you know Christ as Lord and Savior? Have you believed in Him? If not, death is something to be feared. In fact, it's something to be looked at with great terror. It is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. And the judgment is severe. But Christ came to bear that judgment in place of sinners, he came to bear our hell in our place. And all who believe in him escape that judgment and have everlasting life. Through faith alone in Christ alone. It is through faith that we join ourselves to him and his life. So if you've not believed, look to him. Trust in Christ and live then with eternal life. And live as a sacrifice for Christ. By God's grace, may each of us be a sacrifice, a life that we pour out for Him. May God give us all that desire and that, that diligence. Let's end with uh, one of the hymns in our Songs of Praise book. Hymn number 23, which is Psalm 23, and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 23. Father, what a comfort that is that you are with us constantly and you'll lead us home safely, triumphantly. Thank you for that assurance. Thank you for the sacrifice that was made to obtain that blessing for us. Thank you for your son. May we know him better and live for him, live for our triune God, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.